Robert Lifton is a lecturer in psychiatry at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and distinguished professor emeritus of psychiatry and psychology at the City University of New York. He's written lots of books, and I think he's writing another one. <clears throat> His recent works include uh, Medical Complicity and Torture in Connection with the War in Iraq, The Comparative Study of Nuclear and Climate Threats. He's developed a general psychological perspective around the paradigm of death and the continuity of life with emphasis on symbolization and the formative process and on the malleability of the contemporary or protean self. Among his books is Life, Death and Life, Survivors in Hiroshima, which was a National Book Award. So, Dan, if everything is okay, Professor Lifton, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate that introduction. Uh, it sounds a little bit as though it's about some other fellow other than me, but I'll try to live up to the standards of that other fellow. Uh, anyhow, I know you've been hearing a great deal about nuclear threat and uh, where and how uh, it applies in our contemporary world. Uh, that couldn't be more important at this time, but it's also important to look at what nuclear weapons have done, are doing to human beings, and how we human beings are psychologically responding to them. It's really uh, suggestions about that dimension that I'll make uh, during my, my talk this afternoon. The first lesson I learned about nuclear weapons came to me after I'd spent a short time in Hiroshima, a city that I arrived in uh, in the early spring of 1962, uh, just about 57 years ago. Uh, and I talked to many people there, and what I discovered was that after the dropping of atomic bombs on uh, human populations in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, surely a tragic turning point in human history nobody had studied it. People had interviewed some survivors. There had been uh, valuable uh, books written by physicians who made uh, observations uh, on behavior and uh, medical effects of radiation at the time. And there had been lots of studies of radiation, but nobody had really studied what had happened to the city of Hiroshima from that first atomic bomb. Uh, this gave me the thought that the greater a human problem, the less likely we are to study it. That's partly because such problems defy our assumptions and often our methods. And we have great difficulty in finding a way to get at that problem uh, or in uh, gathering the energy and perspective to, to have the courage to approach it. What I found that in Hiroshima, uh, from just a split second in time, exposure to that weapon led to a lifelong encounter with death. In the stages of the immediate sea of death, of acute radiation effects through bleeding into the skin, of chronic radiation effects through uh, cancers uh, and leukemias, and then finally through a sense of identification with the dead all through that moment, that split second in time of being exposed to the weapon. Uh, this gave us what I call imagery of extinction, uh, the sense that we are capable of destroying ourselves as a species with our own technology uh, and to no purpose. There is also the deadly efficiency of that tiny atomic bomb. Uh, you know, more people were killed in the raids on Tokyo in March of 1945, many more than were killed in Hiroshima. Uh, but there were hundreds of planes that were used, and in Hiroshima it was one plane, one bomb, one city, uh, and also a special legacy of radiation effects, uh, which I've just referred to. 
that was a tiny nuclear weapon. Uh, it's of interest that although we built them to a thousand times that size, there's a return to a miniaturization of the technology in connection with what we call modernization, which returns to the size of that tiny atomic bomb uh, and makes it more usable. This leads us to the subject of nuclearism, and uh, I'll just say a bit about it, but I think it's the great spiritual disease of our time. And uh, it really has to do with a kind of perverse spiritualization of nuclear weapons. It began in a way with Oppenheimer and Bohr, two great physicists and uh, humane human beings. Bohr was, of course, a father figure to Oppenheimer's generation, much beloved and uh, creator of much of complementarity theory. And in complementarity theory, uh, you could look at matter in different ways that seemed unrelated. So you could look at particles or you could look at waves. And the two men wondered whether the same couldn't be said about nuclear weapons or atomic bombs. Of course, they're destructive and deadly, and one couldn't keep those secrets. But on the other hand, maybe if they were used, they would be a kind of redemption to humankind because people would realize how destructive they were, and in that way, never create new wars in which they might be used. Here is an early manifestation of nuclearism, of depending upon the weapons as a kind of human salvation. After all, the weapons could do what only God could do in the past, and that is destroy the world. And so there was the assumption in nuclearism that uh, they could uh, maintain national security, keep the, uh, keep the peace, keep the world going, and indeed they could be objects of deification. Uh, and in that way, nuclearism uh, really manifests itself as a dangerous spiritual disease. Now, nuclear weapons are apocalyptic simply by means of their size. And we have to always look at the apocalyptic dimension uh, associated with nuclear weapons and also with climate change. And in that apocalyptic narrative, there is the destruction of the world always in the purpose of purifying, purifying the planet and re-spiritualizing it because there's a remnant who are left with the end of the destruction who are there to recreate the world in a more beautiful and pure way. And this can be secular as well, because Mao Zedong has been uh, quoted as saying that if the so-called imperialists uh, are so uh, foolish as to start a nuclear war, what will follow upon in terms of the survivors will be a society, and he means a Maoist society, much more beautiful than any we have known. That's uh, the that's the narrative of the apocalypse as a source of purification. I'll say just a couple of words about the apocalyptic twins, which are ongoing in my recent work. And what I want to emphasize is that <clears throat> nuclear and climate threats are interwoven. <clears throat> they're separate in some ways, but they're <clears throat> never removed from one another. For instance, um, all the nuclear tests were experiments, and there were geologists and earth scientists and physical anthropologists, all kinds of scientists studying the experiments, what they revealed. An early figure, Earl Reynolds, whom I knew in Hiroshima, uh, a figure in radical environmentalism of the kind developed by Greenpeace, emerged from Hiroshima, as did those early climate movements, uh, and he eventually sailed his small yacht into areas where nuclear testing took place by the United States or Russia, Soviet Union then, or anyone else, uh, starting from an anti-nuclear position, which he had developed from working in Hiroshima. Or if you look at the Marshall Islands, uh, 
they really are uh, an exemplification of our joint uh, nuclear and climate threat. The Marshall Islands are threatened with existential uh, uh, disappearance, really. They could sink into the sea just because of uh, uh, their danger, as which they share with many South Pacific islands uh, of the sea level rise. But also, we conducted from 46 to 50, 1946 to 1958 the most intense a series of tests ever conducted anywhere with enormous effects on the Marshall Islands, which Kai Erickson and I were able to study uh, in preparing a report for one of those islands, Utrecht, in terms of the still present uh, remains and uh, threat of radiation effects to anyone who lives or eats or breathes the air of the Marshall Islands. Uh, of course, there's nuclear winter, which we think of as a nuclear event, but it's also a climate event. Uh, the rays of the sun being blocked by debris from nuclear explosions so that instead of global warming, you get global cooling and the earth is uninhabitable. It's the human habitat that's uninhabitable. Climate uh, absurdity, the fact that if we do nothing other than what we're doing now, we will destroy our civilization through uh, our use of uh, uh, greenhouse gases. And that is the ultimate all in enveloping threat to our planet, within which nuclear weapons very much have a central place and can be the source of that destruction. Uh, I did a study with uh, with Charles Strozier at City University, and without going into it, we found in the early 1990s that people associated to nuclear threat and climate threat in the same paragraph, the same sentence, the same thought, which is what the mind does in relation to ultimate threat. And both, uh, both climate and nuclear have very cultic elements. We speak of the nuclear priesthood of so-called enlightened, mostly men, who uh, know all about the weapons and plan their use for deterrence or actual nuclear wars, which can be, so they think, uh, fought and survived, and even won. And with climate threat, um, there, is the <clears throat> there is the idea of rejecting the truths of climate, which now become more and more difficult to do so that uh, we can't really speak of climate denial anymore. It's climate rejection. And they increasingly, the rejectors resemble the members of the flat earth cult, which still, believe it or not, exists uh, as they, in a sense, defy reality that can no longer be completely uh, defied. Well, to end these brief remarks, let me say that what I've said so far is dire, but need not be the whole story. We are not helpless. Uh, there is the movement of nuclear protest and the capacity in Havel's term, term to live in truth. We always need nuclear weapons developments that are made at high levels of governments and from below in the streets uh, through protest and activism. And it could well be that the protest and activism, beginning with the great surge in the early 1980s, had a great deal to do with the fact that, as dangerous as things are, there have been no use of nuclear weapons, at least in exploding them, since Nagasaki in 1945. Uh, movements like the scientist movement, and then the physician's movement, and other movements of ordinary people and uh, of various religious groups have sustained our opposition and have done something else. They've challenged what I call malignant normality. Malignant normality is a claim to the routine that is pressed upon us as being our norm, that nuclear weapons serve to deter, uh, that we could actually use them, 
this is part of what I call malignant normality. Uh, we also have the capacity to be what I call witnessing professionals, bearing witness to the falsehoods of nuclear normality and taking a stand and expressing a form of activism in combating malignant normality and bringing to bear our professional knowledge in doing so. That is holding to, insisting upon nuclear truths and climate truths about what the weapons can do and have already done to members of our species. And then, of course, taking the appropriate actions. I'll close these brief remarks with a line of poetry that says what I want to say. It's by the great American poet Theodore Rutger who wrote, in a dark time, the eye begins to see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lincoln. You've addressed some of the themes we've been talking about at the conference from intriguingly different perspectives. So I thank you very much for that. We have time for some questions. I'm, I'm wondering about the psychology of the people who, um, who promote nuclear proliferation and, uh, and the, the, some of the things we heard about earlier in the, um, about uh, you know, the, the, the efforts to get treaties and, and, and the resistance to them. Uh, and I'm wondering uh, if you can say anything about the psychology of the people who are basically pro-nuke and is there any way to, to address that? And, You're uh, talking about those who promote nuclear proliferation. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, what I believe is that with nuclear proliferation, which is extremely dangerous, there is a trickle-down effect. That, as you know, is a term of Ronald Reagan, the only term of Reagan I ever used. Uh, a trickle-down effect in the sense that there's a lure given the worship of the ultimate power of nuclear weapons, that being a manifestation of the nuclearism of uh, the largest possessors of nuclear weapons, such as the United States and Russia. And there is a lure uh, experienced by other countries to share in that ultimate power and to give them uh, a certain kind of bargaining or bargaining chips in the interactions uh, political and historical. We see that with North Korea and in other ways uh, with Pakistan and India so that preventing nuclear proliferation depends a great deal upon those who hold the largest stockpiles uh, in reducing those stockpiles and indeed eliminating them as the more enlightened contemporary movements in relation to nuclear weapons insist. Okay, um, I was wondering if there's any way to, to address that and if there, uh, can people be persuaded uh, to, to well, change their uh, position? Uh, the way, the, the, there's no magic bullet, but there are ways to address it. Uh, and uh, one way to address it, I hinted at in talking about witnessing professionals. Uh, we can make use of our professional knowledge, whether our field is physics or psychology or anthropology or some other professional field. We can make use of that professional knowledge to insist upon nuclear truths. It has to do with the language of nuclear weapons. If you talk about, as people do, a nuclear exchange, it sounds like gift giving or something like that, as opposed to the uh, uh, extreme destruction of large numbers of human beings and indeed of cities. Uh, so we can insist upon bearing witness and telling the truths about nuclear weapons, but it also takes uh, political and social energies to resist those who take their stand on behalf of the weapons as certain uh, theorists like, or uh, strategists like Herman Kahn and Edward Teller did in the past, and many still do. And that means uh, exposing the truths of deterrence. Once you embrace nuclear deterrence, you embrace 
the possibility of using the weapons under certain conditions, as I'm sure all of you uh, really understand. It doesn't relieve us of actual protest, whether in the streets, um, in our uh, academic situations, um, as citizens, uh, things don't get done politically and socially without action and intervention and taking chances. And as haphazard as that has been, I think it's played a considerable role in maintaining some balance and uh, preventing the nuclearists from completely dominating the conversation and the actions. Yes. Okay. Um, I hear a lot of people on the side that I agree with um, addressing the, the, the people on the other side with accusations and insults. And I, I definitely noticed that you did not do that uh, because I, um, you know, I just don't think it's a good way to get people to listen to you. So I wonder if you have ideas on, on what is a better way. Well, I don't know quite what you're getting at. One doesn't want to insult people so much as tell the truths about the weapons and the harm that can be done by certain policies which uh, consider actually using the weapons. No, that's not an attack on human beings. That's an effort to bear witness to nuclear truths. And, you know, in our society today, uh, we've seen malignant normality imposed on us by lies and manipulations. So it's a constant effort. Uh, it doesn't really, uh, it, it doesn't relieve us of taking a stand, a strong stand, but it isn't a matter of attacking enemies so much as telling truths about what uh, kind of world we live in and what our technology has done and can do. Thank you. Um, my name is Ayana. Nice to meet you. Um, it's, it, I really honestly just want your opinion on uh, what I took away from, you know, the presentation today, all the information I was receiving, because a lot of this stuff I'm learning for the first time. And um, I'm a young person, I believe, so. <laughs> oh, so I, I want to let you know what I, um, I jotted down. And it was um, just my perspective. You could tell me if you agree with it or not or anything that you might think could um, be modified. Um, are you confides in generational leaders to validate their beliefs and goals? For example, social media, music industry, entertainment business, and you know where we get our education from, like the schools. Not to mention the current era is broken up into large groups of now free thinkers and followers of relevancy. I don't believe it is far-fetched to believe younger people can be convinced and inspired to take action. While demonstrating to younger people, it is highly suggested that a familiar approach is used with intentions to speak the language of the new generation for immediate comprehension from them for which Tom is not on our side in this deadly situation. Assign young leaders to all diverse groups globally to collect collectively attack this issue for which it shall and must be addressed. My, my perspective is 25 years old, but I've also adapted to my environment and culture, which I am forced to believe that my opinion should be considered with approaching my generation, with factual, non-biased evidence of what's at stake in strategic solution methods. I need you, and I especially uh, feel strongly about the inter intergenerational sequence of our efforts. Uh, uh, if it's of any interest, I'm just turning 93. Uh, I have children who are in their 50s and grandchildren of 15 or 16 to 21, and they all have some interest in these issues, and they express them in their own way, and they understand, as everyone must, that there's no single generation, or for that matter, single religion or ethnic group that's threatened it's all of us, and that's why I can speak of nuclear and climate threat as apocalyptic twins. Uh, and it's in this intergenerational spirit that I think you put forward uh, that we all must act.
I very much appreciated the book, The Climate Swerve, because it brought together these two twins. And I'm interested in you saying more about this apocalyptic thing that you started out with today. Because in a certain sense, all of us who are here are a remnant. We're a very small proportion of the people who are thinking about these things. Most people, you can't even bring it up. They can't even face an apocalyptic uh, possibility like climate change and nuclear war. And I have found in my life that there's a, re a need to be with others like Peace Action and other groups. And in a way, we're like a remnant, and maybe we're like the people that you're talking about. The so how do you distinguish between the need for us to have a kind of peace-oriented community that we find some human support in, and this notion of an apocalyptic apocalyptic uh, remnant that is not so good. Do you understand? It's a subtle question, but you were raising this apocalyptic thing. Well, uh, there are many different ways, and there's no prescribed uh, approach that's uh, certain to succeed. It's a, you know, people say to me, well, look, I went into the streets, I opposed nuclear weapons, they're still around, what good is it? And my answer is, uh, it's a process. There's never any one sartori moment where the problem is solved. It's a continuing effort to educate, to recognize the inherent apocalypticism of nuclear weapons and of the climate threat, uh, just by the dimensions that they uh, bring to us in threatening our civilization uh, they are they are apocalyptic, and as for a remnant, well, uh, I don't think any of us can claim the wisdom of a survivor remnant, but one can imagine in advance the possibility of having what I call survivor wisdom, taking some knowledge or understanding from imagining what would happen uh, with the weapons. There is a story about Chicago physicists in which uh, they were uh, completing their work on the bomb, and they were walking through the streets of Chicago one day, and one of them suddenly saw the skyscrapers of Chicago destroyed and exploded, and he realized that he was anticipating what the atomic bomb would do, and he went to work in seeking to uh, contribute to the scientist movement, which opposed the use of the bomb on a human population, even prior to that use. So that's an imagination of a kind of survival even before uh, the terrible event takes place. All of those methods, and uh, there's no one that, that's guaranteed, and everything we do counts. Everything. Thank you, Mr. Lifton. Um, I do have a question. So I appreciate your perspective on the subject of, uh, of nuclear weapons. And um, I wanted to say, you know, I believe that the, the key to a uh, successful future for this world lies with our youth. Uh, and I believe that that can be achieved, but it's going to take time. And I wanted to find out, you know, what's your opinion? Uh, what advice would you give to a youth of today, let's say a college student or someone around that age, as far as what steps they could take uh, to take action and be able to gain the uh, attention of the authoritative figures in this world so that we can make a change? Uh, well, it's as much a political as a psychological question. Uh, they interact, of course. Uh, the, there's no clear path. I think that different young people behave differently. Maybe one would start with the fact that nuclear and climate threats are very special and transcend all other threats because there is the capacity in both cases to uh, destroy ourselves as a civilization and indeed as a species. Uh, this young people are perfectly capable of grasping. It's also true 
that we don't want young people or ourselves to be immobilized by this knowledge. One keeps on doing the very small amount one can do personally or as a writer or thinker or observer or professional of any kind. Whatever one can do in the most modest way, one struggles to do it uh, without uh, so immersing oneself in it that one has lost one's capacity to take action. Uh, I think we all live a kind of double life in the sense that we know that at any time uh, with the use of nuclear weapons, everything that we've ever known or loved or been part of can be destroyed. At the same time, we go about our everyday lives uh, with our families uh, seeking pleasure or some balance of pleasure and commitment uh, with that knowledge in some ways always present but perhaps uh, subdued or limited so that we can continue functioning. In this double life, what we need to do is recognize the danger of the threat even as we continue in our everyday life. Uh, and I think that it's often said that young people oh, they no longer have uh, ideals, they just believe in making money or being part of startups or whatever. It's not true at all. It's a question of what connection one makes with younger people in terms of their potential ideals, which hadn't had much chance for expression. And this we also learn as we go along. There's no simple way, but it's also, as I said before, a continuing effort of modest uh, attempts. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Lifton, for your presentation with us today. My name is Terry Clark. I'm with PSR, active in North Carolina. And I've, the youth of today and adults are so fascinated in their video games with killing and post-apocalyptic worlds. Uh, number one, what's going on there? And secondarily, what, how can we use that in some positive way to reach those populations? That's a really thoughtful question, and I'm not sure I have an adequate answer to it. Certainly, we do see uh, addiction to these games, and some of them, as you say, are extremely violent. It, I think what you're suggesting, and it's imaginable, is that the games themselves could be so imagined as to tap nuclear and climate truths and to pick our energies toward confronting these truths, bearing witness, being witnessing professionals, as I called it. Uh, it wouldn't be too far a step from the kind of nihilistic uh, violence of some of the games to um, getting underneath those to the actual nuclear and climate threats that stalk us. And that could be uh, an interesting and useful project for people concerned, call it with the entertainment or uh, various other technological expressions of human thought. Uh, that occurs to me, it's really the inference of your question. Uh, how to do it would be for other minds to discover, but it does seem to be doable to a degree. Thank you, Dr. Lifton. I think I'll give that project to some of our game design students. Possibility. We're very happy that you were here with us today. And uh, the conference continues. And we hope that this is only a first step in uh, towards a nuclear-free world. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.
glad to see your stuff here.